basket, I have a variety of <clears throat> spools of thread and yarn, different colors, different textures. Some are coarse and rough. Some are silky and smooth. Some are thick. Some are narrow. Variety of colors. However, there's not anything here that would make you want to take this random assortment of thread and yarn and hang it on a wall. And it's not in a, in a manner in which you could wear it. It really serves no purpose yet. But take this basket of yarn and entrust it into the hands of a skilled master weaver like Nancy Scott. She can see things that you and I cannot, and she can do things that you and I could not. And because of her ability and because of her skills, because of her vision, what is a collection of random threads and spools can in time become a remarkable tapestry, a beautiful fabric woven together, worthy of being displayed, worthy of being framed, worthy of being worn, all because of the hand of the master weaver. Thank you, Nancy. The work of a master weaver is not only impressive, it's instructive. <clears throat> For what the master weaver does with the loom is what God does with our lives. Each one of you consists of a variety of threads. Your life is a basket, a basket of spools of yarn. Uh, some of the threads are welcome, beautifully colored, finely textured. And you cherish them. Maybe romance would be one or good health or, or good, good uh, upbringing. But also, without exception, each of us has been handed some threads we could do without broken hearts, bad breaks, disease. And so we wonder, how do we process all this? How does all of this come together? Is there a way that all of these differing threads, unique in background and color and texture, is there a way they can be woven together? Well, the promise of the Bible is yes, and God is the master weaver. This promise appears in many fashions and many verses throughout the Bible, but my favorite might be the one in Isaiah 54 and verse 17 where God says so clearly, I'll see to it that everything works out for the best. And this promise manifests itself in many lives in the Bible, but if there is one life that truly demonstrates this, it would be the story of Joseph in the Old Testament who literally went from pit to palace under the providence of God. So we're going to look at the story of Joseph, but before we do so, let's make our statement. We, each week before we begin the message, declare our faith, and we do so by what? Sitting up straight, putting our shoulders back, filling our lungs with air and our hearts with hope. If you see your neighbor not doing this, please elbow them in the name of the Lord. Give them a good elbow. Let's all do it together, shall we? We are building our lives on the promises of God. <clears throat> or the pain in life. And so, Heavenly Father, have mercy, please, upon us. I am very convinced that there are those within the earshot of this prayer who have been handled, handed some yarn that they don't want, and they don't, want, they don't know what to do with it. And, Father, we believe that you can help us now, help us to interpret all the events of our lives through the lens of your providence. <clears throat> please forgive our speaker today. His sins are many and his voice is weak. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. 
Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. And so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. The story of Joseph is the classic story of a person who is taken from, if you like to fill in the blanks, the pit to the palace. It's an abandoned cistern. The 17-year-old boy lies at the bottom of the pit on his side, hands tied, ankles bound, spittle collecting in a dusty pool beneath him. His voice is hoarse from screaming, and it's not because his brothers do not hear him. In fact, 20 years from now, when a famine has dampened their pride and guilt, has tamed their swagger, they will confess, we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. These are the great-grandsons of Abraham, the sons of Jacob, the couriers of the covenant to a galaxy worth of people. Yet on this day, they are a Bronze Age version of a reality TV show. They are so dysfunctional. They hate their baby brother. Here's why. Joseph Joseph was pampered like a prized calf by Jacob. Where the other brothers worked all day, Joseph got to play all day. Where the other brothers had to wear hand-me-down clothing, Joseph got this coat of many colors, an embroidered tunic that was special and unique. Where the other uh, brothers had to sleep in a bunkhouse, Joseph got his own bed in his own private room. Consequently, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. They hated him even more. They hated him. His brothers envied him. Get the point? This is not a very happy family. And when they had the chance to catch Joseph far from home, they stripped him of this coat of many colors. They stripped Joseph of his tunic. They took him and they cast him into a pit. Now, Joseph did not see this coming. He did not wake up that day and think, okay, I need to dress in padded clothing because this is the day I get dumped into a pit. He did not see this coming. The attack caught him off guard, and so did yours. Joseph ended up in a pit, and his pit came in the form of a dry cistern. Yours came in the form of a diagnosis, a foster home, a traumatic injury. Joseph was thrown in a hole and despised. You were tossed in a divorce court and humiliated. Maybe you were put in an employment line and forgotten. You may have been pushed into a bed and abused. You ended up in a pit. No one gets through life without a visit to a pit. And some people never get out. It's not easy. Pits have no easy exit. And Joseph's story really got worse before it got better. You'll remember that he was sold into slavery and ended up in Egyptian bondage. He was put in the household of a, of a ruler by the name of Potiphar where he worked faithfully and was promoted only to be accused, falsely accused of rape And then imprisoned, he went from enslavement to entrapment. He spent two years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Yet the story of Joseph stands out because he never gave up. Bitterness never staked its claim. Anger, it never metastasized into hatred. He not only survived, Joseph thrived everywhere he went. In the household of Potiphar, he was promoted to be in charge of the other servants. Even in the prison, the prison warden put him over all of the other prisoners. And then in the classic bump of all history, Joseph went from the prison to the palace 
and was promoted as prime minister and became the second most powerful man on the planet. Remember what happened? Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the the entire land of Egypt. And Joseph guided the nation through seven years of feast and seven years of famine and really protected not just Egypt from starvation, but the then known world. How did he do this? How did he flourish during tragedy? Well, we don't have to speculate. Some 20 years after the pit incident, when the brothers have come to Egypt needing food, and they discover that their brother that they thought was sold into slavery and probably long since dead by now, had been promoted to prime minister of Egypt, they come into the courtroom thinking that they're about to be thrown into a pit of Joseph's making, and yet Joseph tells them that he has come to understand a promise. And here it is. In God's hand, intended evil becomes eventual good. In God's hand, intended evil becomes eventual good. Here's what he said to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You meant evil against me. Now, this Hebrew word in the Old Testament traces its ancestry to a verb which means weave. Weave. You came weaving evil against me, or elsewhere it's translated braid. You came braiding evil against me. But God, and then with a slight tweak of the tense, Joseph says, but God rewove. You intended evil, but God re-intended. You purposed evil, but God repurposed the evil. He took the very element, the very yarn, if you will, of evil, and he wove good instead of bad. So God took that which was intended for evil, and he rewove it into something that was good. Nothing escapes God's reach. Nothing is beyond his capacity to change and use. His promise to you is this. I'll see to it that everything works out for the best. What can I say to encourage you to stand on this promise? What could I say that would encourage you to interpret all the elements and events in your life through the lens of God's sovereignty or God's providence? That he doesn't create evil, but he can recycle evil, that which was intended to hurt you, and he can recycle it into something good. If you see the difficulties of your life as simply random events that have no significance, no purpose, and no meaning, then you have simply boarded the train that will take you to discouragement and despair, and you'll become a bitter, sour old person. But if you can somehow stand on this promise that life comes with blessings, but life also comes with burdens, and I am going to trust the master weaver to take that which is welcome with that which is unwelcome and weave it together into something good. If you can stand on this promise, if you can stand on the promise that says, I'm not going to build my life on the pain in life, and I'm not going to build my life on the problems in life, but I'm going to build my life on this great and precious promise, then you're going to discover some beauty. Now, how do you do this? How do you do this? Well, the story of Joseph is so rich in the Bible because it reveals to us how someone does this. At least two principles bubble to the surface. First, you've got to trust God in the testing. You've got to trust God in the testing. This is what Joseph did, most specifically during the time in which he was in prison. Do you remember that in the story of the life of Joseph, before he went to the palace, he spent time in prison for the accused rape. At least two years he was in prison. From our perspective, or from a human perspective, it would appear that the young life of Joseph is over. Nothing good is going to come. Satan has him just where he wants him. 
But from God's perspective, God has, God has Joseph exactly where God wants him. Elsewhere in the Bible, we read this. There in prison, they bruised Joseph's feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. Look, the Lord what? Tested. The Lord tested Joseph's character. Now, in the Bible, a test is a trial that purifies and prepares the heart. A test is a trial used by God to purify and prepare the heart. You are being tested, always. You're being prepared. You're being purified. Some days are pop quizzes. Some days are final exams. But we're always being tested. We're always being shaped. Again, if you fail to see this, then you'll interpret the challenges of your life as random issues that you just want to avoid. You'll try to avoid any challenge. Now, nobody gets excited about tests, but if you understand that you serve a master weaver who's going to weave all of this together, you will be able to discover that there is purpose in the troubles that come your way. For when your faith is, here's that word again, tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So we wonder, well, how could a time in jail be helpful for Joseph? How could jail time develop him? We read the story and we begin to understand why. You see, when Joseph was young, he was pampered. He was spoiled. He was soft. A jail time would change that. When he walks onto the pages of Scripture, he's got a little swagger to him, you know. He's bragging about his dreams. He's telling his brothers how they're going to all bow down to him someday. Really not good interpersonal skills. Even when he's in Potiphar's household, he is promoted quickly. He moves up the ladder with not much resistance. The Bible says that he was handsome, good-looking, kind of like your preacher. He moved up the ladder. Could it be? I didn't hear an amen on that one, by the way. But then when he's in prison, when he's in prison, the scripture says, the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all of the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. You talk about a crash course in leadership. Joseph managed willing servants for Potiphar, but he managed unwilling, ungrateful prisoners in the prison. Don't you think that the lessons of the prison proved valuable when he later on was leading the nation? Now, this dungeon looked like a prison. It sounded like a prison. It smelled like a prison. But had you asked the angels about the location of Joseph, they would have said, oh, Joseph, he's, he's in job training. He's in boot camp. He's being prepared. Now, I know this station in your life feels like a hospital, smells like rehab, appears like unemployment. But if you ask the angels, they would say, oh, she's just in training. God is preparing and purifying her heart for something in the future. Trust God during these times of testing. God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. Do not interpret this time of testing as the absence of God, just the opposite. The Old Testament word for test comes from a Hebrew word that means to take a keen look at, to choose. To take a keen look at, to choose. So if you are being tested, it is because God is looking at you. He is choosing to prepare you for something in the future. God is fully engaged. He sees the needs of tomorrow and accordingly prepares the test of today. He sees the needs of tomorrow and accordingly 
He prepares the test of today. How are you being tested? How are you being tested? Are you being tested emotionally? Are you being tested physically? Is your patience being developed? Perhaps a good question for you to ask your heavenly father is, Lord, what's this test for? Or how am I being tested? And perhaps you can even say, thank you, Lord. Consider it all joy, the scripture says, when you passed through various types of trials. You consider it, thank you, Lord, that you would consider me worthy of this test. But you press into the test of today. You trust God in a season of testing. And one more, you trust God for the timing. You trust God for the timing. We can read the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, most of us, in less than an hour, which might make us think that all of these events happened before breakfast one day. But we forget Joseph appears on the Bible, on the pages of Scripture at the young age of 17. He's at least 37, maybe older, when we bid farewell to him. So this is a 20-year story. He said goodbye to his family. Well, he didn't, have, he didn't say goodbye, but he was separated from his family as a teenager. Here, He doesn't see him again until he's well in his adult years. He spends two years in prison. And those two years probably more, but at least two years, are spent waiting on something to happen. Remember how he became a friend with a butler, and the butler said, I'm going to go back to Pharaoh's house. When I get there, I'll put in a good word for you. Then two years passed before Pharaoh had the dream. Two years. That's plenty of time to grow bitter. Plenty of time to grow anxious. Plenty of time. Some of you have been waiting a long time for your prayer to be answered. Waiting a long time to be pregnant. Waiting a long time to be married. Waiting a long time for that boss to be fired. Waiting a long time. Just be patient. Trust God for the timing. Because while Joseph was waiting, God was working. At the right time, God stirred the sleep of Pharaoh with this odd dream He confused Pharaoh's counselors so they didn't have any kind of explanation. And he prompted the butler to remember Joseph, who was still in prison. And everything came together at the right time. While Joseph was waiting, God was working. He's working for you as well. God is always at work. God is always at work for the good of everyone who loves him. Our call is simply to wait while God works. Now, to wait, biblically speaking, does not mean inactivity. It means a conscious decision to press into the goodness of God. It is a conscious decision to press into the goodness of God, to rest in Him, to trust Him. The Bible says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. What? Do not fret. So waiting is avoiding anxiety. It's just trusting. Trusting that God is still working. And this promise comes to those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Don't you desire that kind of energy? So just keep waiting on the Lord. Again, waiting is not inactivity. It's pressing into the goodness of God. In fact, sometimes waiting takes more energy than working because waiting means, okay, today I'm just going to trust the Lord. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to listen to worship music. I'm going to hang out with God's people. I'm going to serve people. I'm going to press into the Lord, and I'm going to believe that at the right time, God is going to do the right thing. Here it is, folks. You are a Joseph in your generation. There is something about you that our society needs, that your circle needs, that your family needs. You have something of God within you because you're created in the image of God and you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, Satan knows this, so he wants to neutralize you, just like he tried to neutralize Joseph. And so he brings these plots He hatches these plans. He comes weaving trouble. But the story of of Joseph is in the Bible to teach us, to convince us that the 
goodness of God trumps the plans of the devil. In the mathematic equation called Joseph's life, I count this. One broken promise, at least two betrayals, several bursts of hatred, two abductions, one seduction, unjust imprisonment, ten jealous brothers, one case of poor parenting. Add all of this up and what do you get? God's man for his generation. What was intended as evil, God used for good. Now, how does the mathematical equation of your life add up? What are some of the elements? Maybe you were poorly parented. Maybe you were born in poverty. Maybe you're the victim of injustice. Maybe you have been inappropriately touched. Apart from God's hand, this can result in chaos. But if you can entrust this to your heavenly Father, he can take even that which was intended for evil and he can weave it together into something good. You just keep trusting God in the testing. You just keep trusting God in the timing. To be sure, Joseph would be the first to tell you, life in the pit stinks. It does. But for all of its rottenness, it brings one beautiful blessing. When you're down in the pit, there's only one way to look, and that's up. You keep looking up, and the same God who reached in to rescue Joseph is the God who will reach in to rescue you. Will you stand on this promise? I oh so hope you will. Heavenly Father, grant us today the ability, yes, the faith just to trust you, not to grow sour or despondent, but to trust that you're going to take all of this, all of this mess and turn it, turn it into your message. Help us, Father. We resolve to be faithful during these times of testing and to trust you for the timing. Through Christ we pray and all the church said,